Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the American Dream. Tonight we have three distinguished guests from the Daily Item, uh, starting with on my extreme right, Thor Jurgensen, the the uh, news editor, <coughs> Cheryl Charles, the night editor, and Carolina Trujillo, the uh, person in charge of public relations for the newspapers. Um, we're going to talk tonight about a pretty exciting series, at least in my view, that's been going on in the item called, Am I a Bigot? So Thor, since you're the senior person, why don't we start with you? What, what's going on with that series? How is it going? Thanks, it Jim. And thank you for inviting us on the show. It's a very compelling, interesting show. The series is titled, and I use the word is for an emphasis, Am I a Bigot? And it is a project in a nutshell, and uh, these guys will certainly amplify on this or correct me on it, that is aimed at getting people to think and answer first in their own mind that very question, am I a bigot? And to offer their own thoughts even as they read what I th uh, has now been over a half dozen first person accounts by a wide range of people we solicited answering the question in their own way. This is different type of journalism than many newspapers, especially our size, undertake. It uh, has had an emphasis on one topic relentlessly for over a week, and it's drawn in a lot of different viewpoints, but instead of using standard traditional reporting, we have asked people in their own words to reflect on the topic, and I might add, we will continue periodically to follow up on this topic. We consider it that important. Okay. Cheryl, what about you? Well, when this, when this first came about, we had talked about what question we would ask. The first suggestion was, are you a racist? And I says, no, because <coughs> that's automatically people will dismiss it. So we were looking for something more about self-awareness. So the question isn't, are you a bigot? It's, am I a bigot? Because people need to reflect on their own biases. And it was interesting that some of the first uh, responses were triggers by people who read it wrong. They actually read, are you a bigot? And there were people on the Facebook who saw that, and I thought, you didn't even read that. You automatically felt convicted of something. And the whole purpose of this is for us to start a conversation about where we need to improve. We tend to point fingers at the other, whoever the other is, a different race, a different gender, a different orientation but we also need to look at where we go wrong. And that's what I think triggered a lot of angry responses is because people don't wanna look inward. It's easier to blame someone else. And I found the people who really thought about it would say, if you asked them, they would say, well, yeah, wait a minute, I think I have done things to hurt other people. And when I asked my friends about this, that was some of the responses that I got. When you say we, you're referring to we, the public in general? We, the public, we as okay. individuals, we <coughs> as a community, we as a racial group, a, a sexual orientation group, whatever, we all have our own biases. And it's against someone who is not us. Okay, Carolina, what do yeah, you have to say? Yeah, I, I think uh, to piggyback on, on what Cheryl is talking about, I do believe that um, one of the premises that we discussed as a team was the fact that we all are bigots. We all have our, the way that we see the world, that we think the world order should be, uh, what thing we deem things right or wrong, depending on our worldview. And it's important to understand that about each other and, and that we can come together as a society and we can move forward together by looking inwards and, and doing introspect work because 
only by doing this, we're going to be able to move forward and understand the other from the other's point of view and eyes, which is the most difficult thing to do sometimes. We want to impose our, our culture, our values, the way we see the world on others. And sometimes that's the biggest form of bigotry. Sometimes we just learn, we just need to learn to respect and tolerate. And right now, there's not a lot of tolerance in the world, unfortunately. It seems like the essence of the, of the articles say bigotry hurts. I mean, it really hurts. You know, I talked about if, if this were my daughter, would not my, my, my daughter w want my daughter to go through any of this that, that you've all written about? I, one of the pieces, I can't remember which one, but had a line, it might have been Hong Nets, uh, Lynn City Councilor at Large, about how until you reflect on bigotry, you don't realize how it is used in so many different ways, among other ways to marginalize and, and isolate someone that you don't want to be part of a group, how it's used to make you potentially feel superior to someone. And if you pointed at me right now and said, have I done that in my life? I'd say, yeah, I probably have. Um, and it opened my eyes in reading the pieces including my colleagues, and gave me a chance to reflect on how narrow a perspective I might have had on bigotry until we began this exploration. When I refer to my daughter, I'm referring to anybody's daughter because I think it's easy, you know, it may be a 40 or 50 year old man, you know, well, he's a bigot, he's gone, or he's not a bigot, but he's, he deserves to be uh, disrespected. But when you think about somebody's child and baby, you say, well, why would you ever, ever do any of these things to somebody's baby, right? Well, I have to invoke the name of someone who has probably done more and faced more negativism for her work is Mrs. Jane Elliott, who first, after Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated, she was a school teacher in the Midwest, and she started the brown eyes, blue eyes exercise. And many of us are familiar with that. And if you're not, I urge you to Google her. Uh, and that's a Jane Elliott. But she is, she's in her 80s now. <coughs> and she actually said to an audience of whites, she said, how many people here are willing to be treated the way blacks have been treated in this country? And she repeated that and no one stood up. And she said, if you don't want it for yourself, why would you want that for anyone else? And that's the way we need to look. We need to say, are we complicit in treating someone for me if it's someone who's gay, where I'm a heterosexual female? Is it okay for me to be against someone because, well, they're gay or they're transgender or they didn't come from this country, or whatever, they are different from me. Is it okay for me to see them being treated badly and turn the other way because it's not me? No, if I don't want it for myself, why would I want that for anyone else? Yeah. Jim, this is important journalism, if you want to ask a question in that context, because it allows to linger or sit in the reader's mind for a prolonged period of time and uncomfortably a question that they can look at themselves about and that they can ask other people about. A lot of reporting is very instantaneous, is very brief to the point, and it provides a answer, if you will, as soon as it asks a question. We took to some degree a risk and I would say a bold step by really only asking a question and then and for amplified by, I think, what, seven or eight different voices mm -hmm. at this point. And I, also, go and ahead. also, if you look at society as a whole, you know, there are things in society that don't require um, financial investment and that would substantially change the world order of that society. One of those is shifting attitudes, really doing the exercise of introspect and questioning behavior. 
that's something that doesn't require assent. But if you do have a society where citizens are questioning their own behaviors and trying to not do by others what they won't do to themselves or to loved ones, then we're going to have order, then we're going to have equalitarian treatment, then we can move on with a, more, a better sense of peace throughout the members of that society. So I think it's also a sociological approach to a lot of the issues that we face as a city right now, the city of Lynn. Um, so it's also kind of like a sociological intervention where we're inviting people to really think. It doesn't cost a cent to think um, and really reflect on their own behaviors. We're not trying to get them to do any grandiose gesture after reflecting, but if we can at least get people to think, I think that I will be satisfied with, with the outcome of something like this. So I have kind of a dim view of that working. I, mean, I, I think it's going to you know, get better, but it's been a long time coming. It, it, you know, the the uh, Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. It didn't include women. <laughs> didn't include black men. Mm -hmm. It didn't even include poor men. You had to be a property owner. So as a country, we have been gradually evolving. Eventually, we got black people who got freed from slavery, but it took another 100 years after that to get the right to vote, and they're still being hassled. And there's still institutional bias. Yeah. There's institutional racism that people don't see because they don't <coughs> have to. Mm -hmm. And what I, I reflect on many times, and this is where we are as a society, is George Orwell's Animal Farm, where I won't go into the long story, but at one point it said all animals are equal. And as things evolved or devolved, the next line was, but some are more equal than others. And that's where we are as a society. Some people think they are more equal than others and equality doesn't mean that if i get the same rights as you that you lose it means we all win mm -hmm. but if you believe that you're more equal than i am then you should always get the biggest piece of the pie well that's what it's about right i mean in a lot of cases some of it's just plain ignorance you know there's no pie involved but in other cases it means if I get the job, you don't. And if I can keep you down, then you, then you have less of a chance of getting the job than I do. I've, saw, I've seen it in my own oh, life. Oh, absolutely. You know, really. Absolutely. And there is also fear. Fear of everything. And fear, I was told once by someone very wise, uh, fear is false evidence assumed real. Mm -hmm. So we fear if we open the borders that all of these people will pour in and take our jobs. Let me tell you something. A lot of the people who come to this country are taking the jobs that have been there that you didn't want. There aren't a whole lot of people who are out there who want to be mar migrant workers or, or clean hotel rooms or office buildings in the middle of the night. They are willing to do that, those jobs because some immigrants, and not just brown people, but people from European countries, they come in and they were willing to do those jobs for a leg up. What we are saying is that we don't want you to do those jobs. We don't want those jobs. We don't want you to do those jobs because we don't want to give you that leg up because we're still more equal than you. Right, but it should have, go ahead, Thor. <coughs> An inter interesting part of this series and this exercise we started is the calls from people asking or demanding to know this isn't what a newspaper is supposed to do why are you putting this in front of me and I would ask people like that to think about to read even a small amount of what we wrote or what our writers wrote and ask and think about the differences they outlined in the context of their neighborhoods in Lynn in their families, mm -hmm. and and then and then and then just move out from there to the broader community and the country as a whole. What we wrote about and, and the way we presented it is different than our usual coverage, but.
but I would suggest and even challenge people that it is relevant to everybody's life. I would slightly disagree with you when you talk about uh, brown people taking jobs or other ethnic groups taking jobs. It's not just entry-level jobs. We are all entitled to any job. Absolutely. Based on our skill and our ability to do the job, right? Absolutely. Period. Absolutely. And, and that includes the engineers that are coming from other countries. And it includes uh, a lot of other people, it's not just entry levels. The, the thing is, is that we, we are in this state of fear, <coughs> ignorance, and we're so afraid of someone contaminating us you know what there actually is only one race right. there actually is i think the a lot of things personally i think that if we all were subject to dna testing all of this would end because there are probably more people who have things in common mm -hmm. with each other than they ever ever imagined there are no pure races because there is no such thing as race. Race is a societal invention. Mm -hmm. Because the first people who were white, when they were poor whites, they decided, you know, no Irish need apply. Then there were no Italians. They sent Jewish people back because, you know, and some of right. them were killed in the Holocaust. Right. And, and Greeks, yes, exactly. Right. So there were a lot of people who now have been afforded whitehood to add to the numbers, but that's also because of the fear. And, and our first Americans, the Native Americans, were slaughtered. They were slaughtered. Right. And it's interesting how you point out, because there is a demonization, I, I do believe in that, being an immigrant myself and being, you know, living through these really hard times right now where there's a lot of bigotry against uh, minority communities. Um, it's, it's really interesting that you <coughs> point out the European immigrants and the Asian immigrants because those mm -hmm. are the ones that I believe, um, being Colombian, that are basically excluded from the whole immigration um, debate. Mm -hmm. So it's all about the Mexicans and the uh, Central Americans and the South Americans, but nobody bothers to say, well, guess what? There's a lot of Europeans that are here undocumented. Nobody's rating them, nobody's following them, nobody's questioning them. They can walk the earth just because they're white with blue eyes mm -hmm. and they can just walk freely in any state of the United States. Tell me if that's not a sign of bigotry. That's 100% profiling and discrimination. Just because of the color of my skin, I am assumed to be someone that I might or I might not be. Because my son was born here, he's a Bostonian. He is American, but he looks just like me. So he's gonna have to deal with the exact same issues that I deal with without being born here. I just, I just feel that that's unfair treatment. If, is, if it's everything for everybody, it's equal playing field, let's make it that. So if you get pulled over, they should be asking you, well, do you have your documentation the way they asked Clara Lena? They should be asking you, could you have drugs in the car? Because, or have you been drinking? You're because I'm a gun. black woman, yeah, yeah, because I'm a black woman with, with dreadlocks. Uh, they should be asking the same questions of Thor. They should be asking all the same questions if all things were equal. No one's gonna ask me for my papers. They might ask Carolina, you know what? They don't have the right to ask either of us any of those questions, just like they don't even think to ask you. And this is what we're talking about, institutional bias, institutional racism. And people say, well, why don't they just? Well, why don't you just? If you don't have to think about it, I shouldn't have to think about it. Her son shouldn't have to think about it. My daughter's friends, the young black men who come to my house who have backpacks, and what they have in their backpacks? Monopoly games and Connect Four. And they sit at my kitchen table, and I see these wonderful, beautiful black men, and I have to worry when they walk out my door that somebody's gonna assume that they're a gang. Yep. And they're all exam school students, and they're kids. It's interesting, when we began this project, the three of us had a number of conversations. And I remember sitting a couple occasions listening to Carolina and Cheryl talk, and at first thinking to myself, you know, this doesn't really involve me, or 
Um, this isn't my experience. I'm kind of an observer on this. And it got me to thinking about, well, what's my past and where did I come from and how was I brought up? And then to what degree and what has caused me to change in my impressions of people and in bigotry. And I remember asking myself a question that some people, I think, have posed about this series, which is, well, you know, everything's changed in the country. We've made a lot of progress. Perspectives have changed. Well, first of all, let's analyze that and make sure that's historically true. And then second, then that question should be brought back on all of us. And I asked it of myself in my piece. Uh, how have I changed? What changes my perspective today? And all of that gets to the point of this series being an ongoing conversation and a way and a self-examination that then I think is our goal sparks conversation. One of the most interesting pieces I read was written by the two young women at Marblehead High, um, uh, Avery Kaplowich and Olivia uh, Shower. And the point they made at the start of their piece is that when they noticed anti-Semitic activity online and around the school, their first thought was, I don't want to rock the boat. I'm not going to do anything. Um, maybe it'll go away. And it, but then they were reminded or had a conversation, as I just pointed out, where it was pointed out to them as young Jewish women, they had an obligation to speak up and make a statement and bring this out. And they did that very eloquently, I thought. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, what have you got to say, Caroline? Anything else? I think but, that we've, you know, I, I think that, <clears throat> again, this is a conversation starter. This wasn't intended to offend anybody. This was not intended to uh, push any buttons. This wasn't intended to create a revolution. This was really intended for you as a reader, ask yourself that question and analyze what has made you change and evolve in your own bigotry, if you've ever had any behaviors that are of a bigot, and what will take for you to move forward in that spectrum and really question yourself. So briefly, I want to share my own experience. I, I'm an Irish kid. My grandfather came from Ireland. My grandparents came from Ireland in 1892. And uh, my grandfather put up with that sign, that horrible sign. And as I've said, it goes far beyond not getting a job. I mean, there's all of a sudden the realization a whole group of people do not like my people. They think there's something wrong with us. They've never met us. They don't, don't have a clue. That's usually what happens. Second class right? citizens. Yeah. So <clears throat> I, I read quite a bit about Irish history and Irish literature when I was a kid growing up. And I'm firmly convinced that there was a lot of wrong committed against the Irish. And so it, it's kind of just a logical conclusion that if it's wrong to do to the Irish, it's wrong to do to everybody. We're, whether we're talking sexual discrimination or, uh, or, or any other race or any other kind of group of people. So, uh, pardon me? Or religion. Or religion. There's a right. very strong anti-Muslim fervor in this country. My, one of my sisters happens to be Muslim. Uh, I've traveled with uh, her daughter, my niece, and I was furious when she was suddenly pulled out of a line at the airport and given a, the test for bomb residue on her hands. She was the only one that was pulled out of that line because she was wearing a scarf. My, I was infuriated. However, you're also helpless because if I had pitched the fit that I wanted to, I would have been the one who would have been sitting in jail. Yeah. But that's that, and that's also part of the problem is that we don't, we are helpless to, um, to do anything because those are the underlings. Those are the people who are said, okay, if somebody's wearing a scarf, you pull them out or if they look like they haven't, they, they're not from here, if they, have, if they talk with an accent, you pull them out of line. Whatever, whatever the issue is, that's when some of us get angry because we are helpless. And I'm kind of reminded of the documentary Shoah. And there's a part in Shoah 
which is about nine hours long, where one of the witnesses is saying, and she lives next to, she lived next to one of the camps, one of the extermination camps at the Holocaust. And she's saying, well, it kind of got on your nerves because you would hear them screaming as they were dying. And it sounds very callous and I got so angry. And then on reflection, I says, well, you can't do anything. The authorities are the ones who are doing this. So yes, it would get on your nerves because you are helpless. You join, the resistance. you join the resistance if you can't if you're not afraid of becoming one of the victims and this is where a lot of us are right now we're not sure if wearing the safety pin is going to help no if we're not sure if writing letters helps no so it's easier to sit back either it triggers your anger and you lash out at the victim or the or whoever has has exposed you to this problem or you say well let's not doing anything let's just other people will do that okay we're gonna have to wrap this up in a minute does anybody got anything else to say uh, i want to go back to the baby incident your baby your baby your baby you want you want the best for your baby you don't want anybody anybody hurting your baby with because of whatever your ethnicity is or your religion is. Uh, and I wish we could get everybody to understand that. I mean, I think that's a great perspective to, to start from, a great place to start from. So, I don't know. Um, I used two examples in the article I wrote. One, one was a young woman graduated from high school in Mount Bio, Mississippi, and she was the uh, 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 number one in her class. Valedictorian. Yeah, she was, yes. And, and she was killed on her way home from the ceremony because she was black. And then, uh, so what would her life have been like? The other example I used was the first woman secretary of labor. She was brilliant also, and she got to live her life. And she worked on a ton of labor-related issues, workers' compensation, unemployment compensation, fair labor practices, the Social Security Act. She made the New Deal for FDR. Could that young black woman from Mount Bio become like her? Hmm. Yes, maybe. But she never got a chance because of bias and prejudice. And we got to look at it and say, you know, I don't want my kid to go through it, and I don't want your kid to go through it, anybody's kid to go through it. And I think that's about it. Anybody got anything else to say? You know, to just as a closing comment, you know, just every time you're trying to be a bigot, remember, you know, I can't go to the store and buy a different color suit. I'm brown. Every day of my day that I wake up, I will be brown. So either we have to learn to live with this and move forward as a society to accept that we're all different, or I really don't even know where we're going. Well, thank you very much. It, the item has done a great job with this series, and uh, I hope to see more of it. It's better than reading an article about, say, Congress. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Yeah.